In this video, I'm going to discuss motion blur. Motion blur is a blurring or streaking of objects that are in motion as captured by video or film. The human brain also perceives motion blur on anything that is moving rapidly. So you move your arm really quick in front of you, that's blur right there. Now by default, Maya does not blur anything. So if you have something moving, you're not going to see any kind of blur when you render. For example, I've gone back to the chapter 10 ball bouncing file, which is called ball underscore bounce.mb. And this has a ball bouncing across the room. Now this particular version has a ground plane added, has several lights, and the sphere is assigned to a blend shader. So the final version of this will be called ball underscore blur, and that'll be in the chapter 14 folder. In any case, even though this ball is moving fairly rapidly, if I was to render, say right here on this frame, frame nine, there's not gonna be any kind of blur. The sphere is very crisp and clean. Now my anti-aliasing settings are set to highest right now, but nevertheless, there's no motion blur. So if you wanna turn on motion blur, you have to go to the render settings window. I'll go to the shortcut right here, bring up the render settings. In this case, I'm using my software, so about halfway down, there's a motion blur section or rollout. If you expand that, you'll see the first attribute is motion blur. You can just check that on. And from that point forward, you'll get blur on anything that's moving. Now there are two types of blur for Maya software. There's 2D blur and 3D blur. Set to 3D right now. Let's give that a try and see what it looks like. So I'll render out that frame once again. And now you can see a blurriness to the sphere. Blurry up here, blurry here, and the specular highlights blurry. And that blur trail is properly long. What happens is Maya looks at the distance the ball moves over a certain period of time, and it makes the blur trail that long. Now it's not exactly one frame, there's a mathematical formula that occurs, but it's based on a few of the attributes in the render settings window, so I'll talk about that. Now it is set to 3D blur, and what 3D blur means is that when it's gonna render a frame, for instance, frame nine, it goes back in time a little bit and forward in time a little bit to determine a start and end position for that sphere. Then it places a number of iterations of the sphere from the start point to the end point over that duration and merges all those different little renders together to have a blurred object. It's called 3D because it's actually combining multiple renders of that object along its motion path. So it's a more accurate kind of motion blur. It's good for any kind of object that's moving rapidly or it's making unusual turns or rapid turns because it's actually seeing where the geometry moves over time. Now there's a blur by frame and the blur by frame attribute simply is a multiplier. By default, you're doing a realistic motion blur that would be equivalent to a video camera or, or a film camera. However, you can exaggerate the blur by increasing this number here. Now, this is an artificial increase of the blur in this case, if I set that to three. So now if I re-render, the blur trail is artificially long. Now it's too long to be realistic for the distance that objects move, but that's the option you have. You wanna do something stylized. Otherwise, you just leave that at one. Now, as I said, it's not exactly one frame in terms of its motion. It's based on this formula in order to determine start and end position to create that blur trail. Let me just re-render this with the default blur by frame again. There we go. And that formula looks at the duration the shutter is open. There's a virtual shutter. The shutter is a thing that opens up to expose one frame of film or one frame of video. And also looks at a special option under the camera attribute editor. We'll take a look at that. If I go up to a view panel where I have the perspective camera, like right here, I can go to view, camera attribute editor, and all the camera's attributes will pop up in the attribute editor. So there are the attributes. And if you scroll down, there's a section called special effects. And in special effects, there's something called shutter angle. So as it's calculating the blur, what it's doing is it's also looking at the shutter angle value on the camera that's rendering. And this is related to motion picture cameras that use actual film. Old Panavision cameras, old cameras that are pre-digital would have a spinning shutter. And that shutter has a little pie-shaped cutout, which is a certain angle. That's a shutter angle. As a disc spins around, it exposes one frame of film for a certain duration. 
In any case, the size of the shutter angle affects how long the motion blur is. So each camera has a slightly different result on the resulting blur. So what happens is Maya looks at the blur by frame, looks at the shutter open and close, which right now is using default values, which is backwards in time 0.5 and forwards in 0.5 frames, and then takes the shutter angle into account to come up with where the ball needs to start and where it needs to end throughout the blur from one frame. Now it's too hard to discuss the formula right here in this video, but one trick is to render out a frame and watch what it's doing on the timeline. So I'll put my render back up here. I'm going to re-render with the previous settings. Now if you watch the timeline carefully, you'll see that the timeline actually moves briefly as I hit the render. So I render. And it goes very quick, but what it did is it went to 9.2. So what that means is Maya is going back to 8.8, .8, in other words, negative 0.2 frames, and then forward to 9.2, or forward by 0.2 frames. And therefore, the blur trail is laid between the position of the ball at frame 8.8 .8 and the position of the ball at 9.2. And that's how it figures out the length of the blur trail. I'll do that one more time, just watch the timeline once again. There it goes. Just hop to 9.2 very briefly. So it's not actually blurring the sphere along one frame's worth of motion, because the shutter angle is taken into account. And that's actually pretty realistic for motion picture film. And Maya is built for professional visual effects, and motion picture film is still used quite a bit, as opposed to just purely digital. In any case, you can adjust the shutter angle if you want to lengthen or shorten the blur. If you go higher on the shutter angle, the blur will become longer. If you go shorter on the shutter angle, the blur will become shorter. So for example, I can raise shutter angle to 360, which is the maximum, re-render that, I get a longer blur. So right here, you can control the blur. If you want a shorter blur, you can enter a small number, like 20, and that'll be such a short blur, it's almost impossible to see. Again, the default's 144, which is common shutter angle for motion picture cameras. Now, you don't have to change this if you don't want, but just be aware that it's there. And of course, you can also change the settings in the render settings window. I already mentioned blur by frame, which can exaggerate the blur. It's also the use shutter open close. Now by default, it's using these particular values right here. If you click this on, you can determine when the shutter opens and closes. And this just means 0.5 frames backwards in time and forwards in time. And of course, that's like the shutter angle as part of that formula. But you can exaggerate the blur here. You can make it go further back in time or more forward in time to give the blur different positions to work with, or even put in bigger numbers, like you put negative one into shutter open and one into shutter close and have a longer blur trail. Now, if you don't want that, you want it to be more realistic, just leave that off. And the default blur is fairly good. Okay, so that's 3D motion blur. Now, the other style of motion blur is 2D. 2D is a bit of a trick motion blur. It doesn't really pay attention to the exact position of the object along its motion path as it's figuring out the blur. It does a bit of a trick. It figures out its current position, where it is, say, on frame 9, that makes a linear blur across from that point. And the blur might be the correct length, but it does not take into account rapid turns, rapid changes in direction. It can't deal with that. But a lot of times, you might not have the animation in the first place, so 2D is fine in many, many cases. One great thing about 2D is it renders really quickly. 2D is basically a Gaussian-style blur that's applied to the render as a post-process, so it comes in at the very end. We can give it a try. There'd be slight variations between 2D and 3D, but as I said, 2D is perfectly fine in many situations. So there's the 2D blur. If you were to compare them, the 2D blur is a little bit more opaque, the object seems a little bit thicker, whereas the 3D motion blur, the object gets a little bit more transparent on the edges. But if you're worried about render times, 2D is fine in most situations. Now, 2D also has a set of options, including a blur by frame, which you can use to exaggerate the blur, and a separate blur length. And the blur length simply, once again, multiplies the length of the blur, so you can even extend that blur out further. Again, since it's a linear blur, the blur will be on a straight line. So blur length just extends that blur along that line. So I'll try something like 10. And now I'll make a very stylized blur. In fact, it's incredibly stylized now. It's 10 times as long as it should be.
If you don't want it to be stylized, just return that to one. Also, as you use shutter open and close, works the same way. You can fine tune the positions it uses for the object that's moving. There's a couple extra subtle things here. A blur sharpness is a subtle way to adjust the blur when it moves in front of other objects. You can raise or lower this to fine tune the edges of the blur. Occasionally when objects are crossing, they're all blurred. There might be little artifacts. You can try different values for blur sharpness to try to improve that. There's also a smooth value, which will attempt to smooth the edges. Again, it's more an issue when objects are crossing in front of each other. If you don't see any artifacts with the render, you don't have to adjust blur sharpness or smooth value. But if you want to try just to see what it looks like, you can always do that. Let's say I move up blur sharpness and I'll return the blur length to one. We'll give that a try. There it is right there. Pretty sharp, not much blur. If I lower the blur sharpness, the blur comes back. So if it feels too fuzzy, what we can do is raise the blur sharpness to slowly sharpen the blur and reduce the fuzziness or the blurriness of the edge. But if you want something more realistic, you can just leave it at one. Then that's basically motion blur. Again, if you want motion blur, you have to have objects that are moving and you have to turn it on right here under motion blur. Now, if you're using mental ray, I'll talk about that briefly. If you are using mental ray, and I'll switch over to that right now, Mental Ray has its own motion blur in its own section. If you go to the Quality tab, it'll take a second to load up. There it goes. And you scroll down, there's a motion blur section for Mental Ray. It has a menu where it's off, but there's two modes. There's no deformation. And that's very similar to 2D motion blur from Maya software. And there's Full, which is very similar to 3D. Now one advantage that 3D motion blur or full motion blur has over 2D or no deformation is not only does that kind of blur work great for objects that move rapidly and change direction, but it'll also take into account objects that deform. So if you have a surface that deforms and you want accurate motion blur, you can choose full if you use a mental ray or choose 3D if you use in my software. Now mental ray has some of the similar style attributes. It has a blur by we can exaggerate the length of the blur. Has an open shutter and closed shutter right here, which works in a similar fashion. In terms of where that object starts and stops to determine the blur. And it has some quality settings down here. Motion steps affects how many individual steps are used to determine where the ball moves over that short duration that's trying to figure out motion blur. So the longer or the higher this value is, the better quality the blur. So the greater number of motion steps, the better the blur. It's also time samples, which is the shading samples taken through time, which again affects the quality of the render. So the short of it is, if you want higher quality with mental ray motion blur, you have to increase the motion steps and increase the time samples. I'll try a quick render of that. And there's a the mental ray blur. It'll be slightly different from my software, but it's a very good blur. So in any case, that's your motion blur. If you're trying to do a realistic render of anything that's in motion, you probably want to turn on motion blur.